Hallelujah. Thank you, lady. Can we give Jesus like a big hallelujah? Jesus, we love you. We praise you. Our eyes are on you, Lord, and we love you so much. Thank you for all that you've done. And Father, thank you for loving us. You are a good Father. I am so amazed. I mean, I'm amazed, Tamara, because this morning, you know, in the green room, I asked, I just had it on my heart this morning to worship about God's goodness. And I said, could you do a song about you're a good, good father? And then I stood there, and the whole worship was about the goodness of God. All of it. And I'm undone. I'm so forgive. I'm looking like a raccoon right now, but I don't care. Glory to God. Oh, my goodness. Hasn't what, I mean, I am always so amazed. And that's why I so enjoy doing conferences with Carrie Pickett, you know, and, and, and with Nicole. Because it's almost like you can tell we're like little pieces of puzzle, of building blocks, building upon each other. You know, I started, God had spoken to me really clearly to build a foundation on uh, on our righteousness because that is the foundation from which we can have intimacy with God and approach him with that fear, with that condemnation, guilt, and shame, and that complex of inferiority, you know, that warm mentality like I'm not good enough and will never be good enough. You know, righteousness is that legal right that gives us that right and that boldness. The righteous are bold as a lion. And then here come beautiful Carrie Pickett that comes and man, she nails it down talking about you are now blameless with that reproach before God, but you're going to have to renew your mind and fix your mind on this new identity because you are a new creation. And then just in case some of you in here, because I know how you work, you're thinking, well, you don't know my past. You don't know I'm a broken vessel. I'm just like, how could God? And then come Nicole that goes and shows you where she came from. And look, she's now like a trophy on God's shelves saying, I don't care how broken you are. I don't care how messed up you think you are. God can take you, change you, transform you, and make you into a beautiful vase. And then, yes, yesterday, she goes and starts talking about the goodness of God, saying how God loves you, that he will never, never, never reject you, push you away. And I love that illustration, you know, how the father came to run to the son. And he didn't just pat him in the back saying, well, I'm so glad, son, you're back. But he, man, he, he, and, and I love the fact that he says he was willing to take the blame of running, which was, you know, that wasn't part of the culture. He didn't care, you know, what he looked like, what he was going, what people were going to think. His heartbeat, his passion was to go and get the son back and bring him as close to his heart as possible. You see what God has been doing. You're so good, Father. Your love and your passion for us is beyond, the Bible says, the love of God that is beyond all human knowledge. We cannot wrap our brain around that love, that unconditional love, goodness and kindness. And you see that one is the reason why Jesus died is so that you and I can have that passionate, intimate relationship with that kind of God whose heart and whose mind is full of you and his heart is beating for you. But so this morning I want to be, you know, I want to go and say, what does it look like? You know, in a practical, in a everyday, what does it look like to have intimacy with God? What does the Bible say about it? Because we can talk about intimacy all we want, but sometimes we've got to go to the nitty-gritty of 
what does it look like? What does it sound like? What, what is it that I'm supposed to do to walk in that intimacy with God? And the Apostle Paul gave us a, a beautiful verse about it, which was really a paraphrase of what Jesus taught to the disciples. And if you go to Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says, I have been crucified with Christ. So ladies, your past, let it be said again, your past behind. It's dead, buried, no more. So stop thinking about it. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, in this body, I live by the faith of the Son of God. And you notice Jesus said, Paul said, excuse me, but Paul said by Jesus' direction, he said, you're old, you're crucified, you're dead. And now you are going to have to learn to live Christ living in you. I love the illustration. It's like God is using your body like a glove. And now it is not you living. It is going to be Christ in you that starts moving, doing, speaking, acting through you. And listen to that same verse in the Message Bible. Indeed, I have been crucified with Christ. My ego is no longer central. That's a big one. Stop thinking about yourself all the time. Stop focusing on yourself all the time. Said your ego is no longer in the center. It is no longer important that I appear righteous before you or have your good opinion and I'm no longer driven to impress God. You know why? Because he's already impressed with you. Christ lives in me, and the life you see me living is not mine anymore, but it is lived by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You see that this new life, now that our past is gone, crucified, that now we've got to get rid of that ego, the big me, 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 myself and mine, that we have now believed that my life is not mine, it's Christ. He's using me like a glove. So now the life, this life, I'm going to have to learn to live it by faith in the Son of God. Now what is faith? I've said it and we'll say it again. The gospel according to Audrey. Faith is trusting God and his word more than what you can see or feel. And now how does faith come? Thank you. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now what word is that talking about? What word is it talking about? You see, in, in the Bible, now let me, you know, that's exactly what actually Jesus said. I said Paul was paraphrasing or saying in a different way what Jesus had been teaching his disciples on how to live this new life. And you remember that verse in John 15. In verse 5 through 7, he says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Lady, you are beautiful branches. And he who abides in me and I in him will bear much fruit. And listen to this. For without me, you can do nothing. Oh, let that sink. If you think you're smart enough, good looking enough, educated enough, you got your all ducks in a row, you've got something coming. Because Jesus says, without him, without living that life in him and him flowing through you, you can do zelch, nada, rien, zero. Or you might think it's important, but at the end, when it's all said and done, God will look at it and 
it will burn like wood and, 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 and hay. Jesus says, without me, you can do nothing. So we've got to let that sink in, knowing this life that I'm going to live, that intimate life that I'm going to live with, with in, in Christ and Christ in me. Him using me like a glove, by the, and I'm going to live it by the faith in Jesus Christ because I cannot do anything on my own. Without me, you can do nothing. For if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done to you. Remember, it actually is saying the same thing. John 15 and Galatians 2 are saying the same thing. If you abide in me and my words, what words is he talking about here? You see, in, in the Greek, and I'm going to go Greek like you do. In Greek, there are two different words for word. And you got the word logo, which the word logos talks more of the information, the education that you receive from your Bible. And then you have the rhema word, which is the living word, the word spoken out of the mouth of God. What we, you and I, might call revelation. And you, now let me say something, because you see us, I travel all over like Miss Carrie, and I go a lot to Asia, to all different, you know, part of the world. And I notice that the Western mentality is all about education. But do you know, and I'm going to, like, okay, keep your stones under your chair right here. Wait until the end to stone me. Would you do that? Do you know that the word study is not in the Bible? It's actually only one time. There is two verses in 2 Timothy chapter 1 that say study your, to show yourself approved. It's not actually talking about studying. It's talking about being diligent to show yourself approved, knowing how to rightly divide the word of God or discern the word of God and truth. And the other word says, study to be silent. What, let me find that verse. I have it somewhere. In 1 Thessalonians 4, 11, study to live a quiet life. It actually means aspire, desire to live a quiet life. And the other verse, the only verse in the Bible that really talks about studying in the book is of Ecclesiastes. And it's in Ecclesiastes 12, 12. And it says, much study is weariness to the, of the flesh. My friend, that doesn't sound like an endorsement. <laughs> Why is it? Because you and I, we have approached the word thinking that I'm going to study the Bible until I get blue in the face. I'm going to get so much knowledge, so much information, and then pff, I'm going to do it. This is never that type of study. is not biblical. It's not in the Bible. I knew that was going to be silent in this Catholic church this morning. This is not the way that God wants you and I to approach the word of God and to abide in him and let his word, ray my word, his living word abide in us. Because you know, in the Jewish culture, do you know what study really looks like? It's a student asking question to the teacher and the teacher asking question to the student and the student answering the question and they have a dialogue. That's how in the East, they used to learn and study the scripture. You remember when Jesus was found in the temple at age 12? You remember what he said? They were astonished by the question he was asking, the answers he was giving. So let's get, you know, that's the reason why in Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says that men will not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. That, my friend, is intimacy. Living this life 
and letting the, the word that God speaks to you, the question he, gave, he gives you, the answers he gives you, the communion and the, the dialogue, the word that God speaks to you, you let that abide in your word. And it's those words that gives you faith because faith comes by hearing, hearing by the, the word that God gives you. And that's where life is. This is where life is. This is where intimacy will start happening. Let me put some oil in the motor. I get excited. <laughs> you know, when you look at the beginning and, you know, on, on Thursday night I talked about what it looked like at the beginning. This is how Adam and Eve had communion with God. It says that God would come in the cool of the day, which, by the way, in the Jewish, you know, the day starts in the evening. Did you know that? And in the evening, which was the beginning of the day for them, God came and spoke. And they had that exchange. And you know what happened? God would give them that manna, those words, and give them what they needed to live the day. And to be successful during the day. And to do what God had called them to do. They lived one day at a time. You know the song, one day at a time, sweet Jesus. It never was God's intention for us to live out of rules and principles and methods and do this and do that and cram our head with a bunch of... of um, and. Keep your stones again. <laughs> to live out of information. We were never created to live out of education and information. We were born to live out of the spirit, out of revelation. You know, for a while, I don't have a college degree. And there was a while where, you know, everywhere I go, I would hear Dr. So-and-so and somebody, they had all those letters after their name, you know. And I felt intimidated. And I felt like, Lord, how can you use me? I don't have all those letters after my name, you know. And one time I went to Burma. I was preaching in Burma. And there was one of the, the directors, the, one of the guy there, the head of the school. He came and he gave me, and I don't know how I knew, God knew. And God what just brought the point across, obviously. That guy had business cards made for me with my name on it. And next to it, it had Audrey Mack, BA, PhD, and Masters. And I look, I'm like, hey, brother, I don't have a BA, I don't have a PhD, and I don't have a master. And then I turned the card, and it says, BA, you are born again, PhD. <laughs> You are preaching healing and deliverance. Masters, Jesus is your master. Glory to God. I can climb on the pulpit. Oh, I would. That settled it for me. Because God showed me that it was not so much interested about me having a big crammed head with a bunch of stuff, but he was interested in me abiding in him and him abiding in me and allowing his word that he would spoke to me all the time, abide in me, and I would live by the faith, by trusting God and his word more than what I could feel or see. And that's how I've lived my life for the last 34 years. And I could tell you some stories as a missionary, that God has been good, has been faithful. You remember, that's what God wanted to do with the children of Israel. In Exodus, when he took Israel out of Egypt and he made them a nation, listen to what he said. He said, if you indeed... Obey my voice. Listen and obey my voice. You shall be to me my treasured possession. And remember what they said and did? Uh-uh, we don't want to listen to your voice. Moses, you go, you hear, you come back, and then you tell us A, B, C, D, E, F, G, what we're supposed to do. 
And because God could not commune intimately with the people of Israel, that is the reason why he brought the law. That's why they, they wanted it. And how many Christians today are living out of a set of rules and principles and methods and how do this and that and that apart from God and they are not allowing themselves to commune with God to hear what do you want me to do? How do you want me to do it? Where do you want me to go? You know, I, I'm all about, like, a, like, like Miss Tracy said, about seeing people fulfilling their destiny. But I want people to fulfill their God-given destinies. Because I hear people saying, you know, just do it for your dreams, your desires, your this, your that. And I'm looking and listening. I'm like, okay, you've got your little thing with my vision, my dream. My... I say, where is God in all of that? I am, my heart is to see God. I want to go where you want me to go. I want to do what you want me to do. I want to say what you want me to say. I want to behave like Jesus. I want you, I want to be such a deny myself. Let my ego die. That's why I'm not afraid to look stupid in front of you. <laughs> to look like a clown. I don't care if I can get my point across. If I can empty myself to let God use me like a glove, that's what I want. Oh, geez. calm down, Audrey. Smile. That's the reason why in Romans 7, 6, it says, now we are released from that law so that we may serve God in the new way of the spirit and not in the old way of the written code. And I love that in Hebrew chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, it says this, they, and you know in Hebrew he was talking all about the new covenant in Christ. It's all about the new covenant. And in Hebrew chapter 3 and 4, it's talking about this new covenant. And listen to what it says in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 4. He said, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered this rest has himself ceased from his own works, his own effort, as God did from his. Do you know what that means? That it's no longer you trying to make it happen, working in the word. You know, like I see people that need healing and they'll go and try to go and listen to all the message and healing and try to, I'm going to do this. And then, okay, that message says, you know, you got to fight the good fight of fight. So I'm going to fight. And then they hear a message that says, enter the rest. So they're like, okay. And then they hear a message, the good confession. I, Jesus is a high priest of your confession. So they wake up in the morning with that little list of confession. Blah, 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 blah. And then, and they, they are worn out, confused, and get in a spin because they don't see a breakthrough. That's not how God meant for us to live. God wants us to go and listen to his voice and says, Lord, okay, this is what I'm facing right now. What do you want me to do? What's the key? You know, this is how I got healed of bone cancer. Holy Spirit woke me up at one in the morning, three days in a row, and he spoke to me. He said, and I prayed in the spirit because when you pray in another tongue, you connect your heart to the spirit of God and you become more sensitive to his voice. So I prayed for a while and then I heard there's cancer in your body. Cancer was not on my radar. Never thought of it, never... But then he gave me the keys. He gave me scriptures. He said, the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And then he said, do this, do that. Don't do this, don't do that. It came, and you know, within, without any intervention, doctors, medicine, and I'm not against all of that. Thank God for them. Or like Andrew said, all the Christians would be dead. But there is a way to live, to abide in Christ and Christ abide in you. Where all of a sudden you live by the faith, by faith in the Son of God, by faith in the word that God speaks to you. And it takes hearing ears to hear and walk and hear what the Spirit is saying to you. That's the life of rest. 
It is not you, white, knuckling it, trying to make it and live the right life with Jesus and live for Jesus. No, no, no. You trying to live for Jesus is not going to make it. It's going to have to be Jesus living in you and through you. Do you see the difference? Many Christians, that's what they've tried to do. I'm going to live for Jesus. No, no, that's you trying to get it and do it. God wants you to enter into the rest. And entering into the rest means you are walking, listening, doing. You hear his voice, you obey. 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 And he will lead you where you need to go. You will find victory in every area. That's how Andrew Womack has lived his whole life. Out of revelation. And you know, here is the key. When Andrew, have you noticed? Andrew preaches. He could be preaching that same old teaching. He's been preaching 150 times. It always comes out fresh. And your spirit comes alive. Your spirit draws like, it, you hear it like it's the first time. Because it's coming out of his abiding in Christ and Christ abiding in him and his word abiding in him. I'm going as fast as I can. <laughs> could somebody please, over there in the sound booth, could you stop the clock, please? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> no, no, hallelujah. <laughs> and you notice in, when you, this exactly in Hebrew 3 and 4, that's exactly what the author of, of Hebrew is saying. Say, today if you hear his voice, don't harden your heart. Today, hear his voice, don't harden, and he says it again and again, because that is the key of entering into the rest, is hearing his voice and not letting your heart ignore it or think, oh, it's just me. No, listen and obey, do it. That's where is the key to the abiding in Christ and letting his word abide in you. That is the key of Jesus using your body like a glove. He tells you where to go, what to do, how to do it, and you go, okay. Bam, here is that little glove going, doing, speaking, and it's Jesus in you doing it. But he needs your cooperation. He needs you to listen. So you and I, we've got to have to have a love, a passion, and a strong desire to hear the voice of God. Because if this is how, we have to learn to abide in Christ and Christ abide in you. And the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who died and, and gave himself for me. If this is how I do it, by hearing his voice and obeying his voice, then we got to have a desire to hear that voice. And here again, that's all about intimacy. Hearing the voice of God, walking one. I mean, you cannot be as close as that, that having God himself on the inside of you. You cannot be any closer than that. And learning to be with God, being aware of God in you, and living your life from that understanding, that consciousness. And it, so it means, and listen to that verse, because you see the Holy Spirit is, the Holy Spirit is, the key player of this new covenant. He is the key actor, the key player of this new covenant. That's why Jesus says, hey guys, I'm not going to leave you orphans. I'm going back to the Father. You be, hallelujah. He said, but I'm going to send you one exactly like me in everything. And he's going to guide you, teach you, help you. And so the Holy Spirit is the one in you that's going to help you to live that life of intimacy because that's what the Father wants. Jesus paid the price so you can be righteous and approach the Father and then he sent the Holy Spirit to help you and get in that place of intimacy. So like I said, intimacy with the Father will have to start with a desire and a strong pursuit. 
I love Psalm 119, verse 162. It says, oh no, I forgot to give you that verse. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. He says, the grace, and Paul always will end his letters like that. The grace of the Father, no, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I was just paying attention to see if you were, I was just checking if you were paying attention. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the communion. Thank you. Aren't those guys over there in that booth amazing? I mean, I haven't even started spitting it out of my mouth. They already have it on the screen. Guys. <laughs> hallelujah. Here it says, you and I in this Intimate walk with God, we've got to understand the grace of Jesus. This righteousness is by grace. It's a gift. You are made righteous by the grace of God. And you got to know and be settled the love of the Father for you. Like Nicole so spoke in the Greek, the Hebrew, and in her Nicole gospel, she's told you the love of the Father. But there is the communion of the Spirit to allow you to walk in it. So that means we have to have a desire for the voice of God, contrary to the children of Israel who didn't. We've got to be passionate and pursue to want to hear God, not be satisfied to read our two little chapters and go to Sunday school and pray in tongues once in a while. We've got to have a desire and a passion to talk to God, to hear God, to commune with God, to become one with Him. It starts with a desire. And in Psalm 119, verse 162, it says, I rejoice at your word as one who finds great treasure. And here again, that word, word, is the, in Hebrew, right? Nicole, in Hebrew, it's the word emer. And it means something said, a voice, here again. And I love those songs that you sang this morning was all about love. I love your voice. I said, yes, <laughs> loving the voice of God, not just be satisfied to memorize five verses, but to be passionate, to hear the voice of God, God, whatever it takes. That's why Jesus, in Matthew 13, verse 44 through 47, Jesus said, and he was talking again and again, he was ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say. And he said, the Bible says he cried out. It was not, a, hey, guy, you got ears to hear. No, he cried out as the cry of his heart. Let him hear who has ears to hear. Hear what the Spirit of the Lord wants to say. And then he said, you're going to have to look at the Word, the voice of God and the Word of God like a treasure, a hidden treasure, like a pearl of great price. Did you notice that treasures are not found on the surface? Pearls of great price are not found on the shore right there in the ocean. You got to dig. You got to search. You've got to pursue. Have you ever seen those treasure hunters? They will put their life in peril to find the hidden treasure. That's their priority. That's all they can think, talk, imagine. That's all they want is find that hidden treasure. We've got to have that kind of passion to hear God, to speak to God. Because here is something I have found about God. He's love. He loves us so much. But the Bible says in Proverbs 25, verse 2, it says the glory of God is to hide a matter, but the glory of kings is to search out the matter. You know why God did that? Because God knew that that would separate the curious, those who just want to follow Jesus for, oh, 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 you're going to bless me, you're going to bless me. Jesus, I need this. Jesus, I need that. Oh, it feels good. Oh, oh. That would separate the curious and those that are not serious for the things of God from those that will pursue it like a hidden treasure, that will be willing to dig, that will be willing to pursue. That's why the Bible says in James 4 verse 7, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. 
Because God, there's something about honor. If you honor the voice of God, you honor his word, his voice, you will attract it. But that's the reason why sometimes when somebody would go, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus would ignore him. Because he knew that her culture, her people would dishonor the things of God. Didn't honor the word of God. And Jesus ignored her. And then finally, when he told her, he said, yeah, it's not good to throw the bread for the children to throw it to the little dog. And then when he saw that her heart understood the love of God, the compassion, said, yeah, but even a little crumb is enough. What it shows us here, that God is not automatically going to speak, speak to those who dishonor, who don't desire his voice. Those who don't desire communion, intimacy with him. He's not going to throw his word and commune with somebody who, I don't care. Keep your stone. Intimacy, any kind of intimacy in marriage, between friends. You know, when you are, you know, it, 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 you've got to desire and want that intimacy, and you will go as deep as you desire it, as deep as you want it, as deep as you go after it. I know that's not popular, but it's biblical. Don't look at me with that tone of voice, because I didn't say it. The Word said it. That, you know, that whole parable of the sower where Jesus was saying he was ears to hear, let him hear. That whole parable is really talking about the condition of somebody's heart. And you know that type of heart. He said they received the word with joy, but they had no root in themselves. And they, they couldn't produce fruit. You know what? That, I, that puzzle, I said, Lord, if having roots in my heart is what will enable me to get revelation, to hear the voice of God, then how do I build a root system? How do I build a root? Because those who didn't have roots, persecution came, tribulation came, and they <laughs> fell apart. So Lord, if I want to have that intimate walk with you, to hear your voice, to have a heart sensitive that can hear your voice, obey, and move in sync with you, you using my body like a glove, how do I build that root system? And I was in my shower one day. I just asked a question. And I was in my shower one day, minding my own business and do what you do in a shower. And God spoke to me. He says, Audrey, plants, why do they start building roots? And I thought, and I said, they're looking for moisture. They're looking for water. Yeah, he said, because they are thirsty, right? So a heart that doesn't have a root is a heart that lacks that thirst for the things of God, that lacks that desire for the things of God. So right here, oh, Lord, stop the clock, please, for me. Caleb, stop the sun. You can do that, Father. Thank you. Slow it down. But God is so good. He's so merciful. So good. You know, Philippians 2.13 says that it's even him that will give us the power to will and to do. If you are here this morning and you said, yeah, I want intimacy with God, but I don't have that passion, that desire. I open my Bible, I just go and try to talk, and it's like, I don't, it's not exciting. I don't really, I'd rather just go on my phone and do this, or I'd rather go shopping with a girlfriend, but I don't really. God is so good. If you have the will to will, if you can tell and give him your little fishes and your little loaves and say, God, that's all I have. I have a will to will. Would you please give me that desire to want to hear your voice? And now let me say, for you ladies, if you are here in a conference in the middle of nowhere, in I don't know how many feet altitude, it's because you have a desire. <laughs> but just in case, just in case, some of you are caught in the middle, you've been dragged by the hair by your mother or grandmother, I don't know, and you hear and you're like, oh yeah, 
But you said, you know, I would like to have that desire and that thirst, that hunger for the voice of God. Then let's just pray a quick prayer right here. Just repeat up to me from your heart. Father God, give me the will to love your voice and your word. I put my heart before you, Father. So give me the power to will, to desire, and your grace to do it. Thank you, Father. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So how do you hear? Once you have that strong desire, I know what you're thinking. Then how now do I get to hear God's voice? It's just very easy, really. We've made it more difficult than it is. And Miss Carrie kind of talked a little bit about it. And I thought maybe she had read my notes during the night. <laughs> the first thing we're going to have to learn to do is quiet ourselves down. Did you notice that this world is geared to distract us, to get us so busy, to get us so with a mind full of all kind of stuff, that it's hard to be still and be quiet. I remember when I, I, I used to, to, to go to India a lot, and I would go into villages where they had no internet, no phone, no internet. I loved it. <laughs> because I was not tempted to go on my computer and check the emails and this and that. It was such a conducive atmosphere to be still, quiet, nothing and to hear. So that's the first thing we've got to, I love that David in the psalm, he says, you be silent, O oh my soul. We've got, and I love, I heard Andrew one time that he said, and I've done that many times myself, where he spent a whole, I don't know how many hours, sitting, just being quiet and still. And all of a sudden he realized he could hear that little noise through the, the leaves. He could hear the little chirping of the little birds. He could, you could hear things that you cannot hear when your mind and your body is so busy. So that will maybe demand some, you know, ladies to turn off the phone. Turn off the stupid phone. Put it on airplane mode. And I understand that some of you moms, you've got, you know, kids you try to get quiet, alone, kids are, mommy, I need my this, I want, you know. Sometimes you might need, you might have to lock yourself in the bathroom, in the toilet. I don't know. But here is the thing I've learned about God. If you give him your little loaves, your five loaves and your little fishes, and you understand what I mean by that. If you give him with a desire, and with an intention, and with a heart to pursue God, you give him the little you have, God's going to multiply it. And it, it, it might be 15 minutes, 30 minutes, but God will give you and download so much that it'll be like, man, I spent a whole day with God. God is that good, that merciful, and that powerful. <laughs> number two, number two, we going to, you know, and here is a good way to still yourself and quiet yourself. Fix your eyes on Jesus. Get your eyes off of you and fix your eyes on God. That's why God gave us eyes in our heart. Andrew has a powerful teaching on imagination. You are there still and say, Lord, I want to, to talk with you. I want to be with you and hear from you. You know, and here is something else. The Bible tells us to be quick to listen and slow to speak. Sometimes it takes us stopping blah, 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 and just say, Lord, I'm going to be quiet and fix. And once you fix your, uh, your eyes, your imagination, you might imagine yourself walking with Jesus. You might just imagine Jesus sitting down and you next to him drinking a cup of coffee. You might imag imagine Jesus into your world or you in his world, and with the eyes of your heart, you picture Jesus. Because you know what the Bible says, Hebrew 12, 2? It says that Jesus is the author and the finisher of your faith. And what is faith again? Being able to trust God and his word more than what you can see and feel. And how does it come? 
come by hearing and hearing, by fixing your attention on Jesus. You take your eyes off of yourself. And a great way to do that is by worshiping. That is, wasn't the, the, oh my gosh, the worship was phenomenal this morning. All the songs were about the goodness of God, the greatness of God, the love of God. It was no, because you see, here is something. The Bible says that in the last days, people would become lovers of themselves. And that, my friend, is not just in the word. It's creeped into the church. And if you notice so many times, people think they're worshiping God, but all they're doing is singing about themselves. Me, myself, and mine. I this and I that. You can look at the song. If it's filled with I, me, my, I, 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 it's not in its proper term a worship. Because worship is magnifying God, like Tamara did so well this morning. Worship is talking about God, telling how good he is, how great he is, how powerful he is, how loving he is, how much we love him. Come on. Now, there is a place for devotional worship. The Lord spoke to me one time, and he says, don't be so hard on it. There is a place for devotional worship. But when we are together, and you'll notice I was talking with Julian this morning. you notice in the crowd, when you start singing those songs like, God is good, God is holy, God is great, God is... All of a sudden, with that nobody, you don't have to psych people up. I hear worship leader, I don't know how to psych people up to worship. You know what I tell them? Just start worshiping God and people will get in. And you'll notice when you start singing and magnifying God and putting your eyes on him, without anybody saying a word, people start raising their hand and entering in. Why? Because deep call unto deep. People's spirit wants to hook up with the spirit of God. It, your spirit desires that communion. So number one, you quiet yourself. Number two, you fix your eyes on Jesus. And number three, you yield to spontaneous thoughts. Sometimes we think, it can, only, it can be me. It's me, it's the devil, it's God. You know, here's a difference. You remember when Jesus said in John 7, verse 37 through 39, it says, if anyone is thirsty... Let him come to me, and out of his belly will flow rivers of living water. That's why all across the Bible, when it talks about the voice of God, it talks about water, flow, rivers, because the voice of God, the thoughts of God will come in your spirit like a spontaneous thought. It is not intellectual. That's the difference. If you've got to think about it, conjure it, Think and try to make it up, it's you. But when it comes out, I remember some of the greatest miracle is when I'm ministering, all of a sudden a spontaneous thought. Spit in that guy's eyes. I'm like, spit in his eyes? That surely didn't come from me. I go, I spit in the guy's eyes. The mind the man is blind, he can't see. Another time a woman has a big belly and the, the, the a spontaneous thought hit her in the stomach. I went, oh. And I'm like, surely that doesn't come from me. It just came like a spontaneous thought. And I yielded to it. That woman was dying of, 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 I think, stomach cancer. She had a big belly. She looked pregnant. And God told me to punch her in the stomach. But because I knew the voice of God, you see, I knew the voice of God. I obeyed. That woman was totally healed. But now let me say, let me tell on myself, lest you think I'm that big and that great with a bow. You know what I did next time? I thought, I'm like, oh, if I punch her in the stomach and she got healed. Now, you see, that was not God's leading and spontaneous thought. That was me in, in, in a thought and an analytical way. I went and punched somebody in the stomach. Nothing. It was, I was not abiding in Christ. I was all of a sudden tapping into my own thinking and my own ways. You see the difference? Spontane Here is an example. Did it ever occur to you? You're driving, minding your own business, and all of a sudden, you've got the face of a friend flashing in front of you. What is that? It didn't come from you. 
That was God's voice, God's thought, God's vision. Or some of you have woke up. How many of you, you woke up the other day with, you know, I talked to a Sharon. She said she woke up. God gave her a vision, gave her a word, gave her directive. How many of you, God spoke to you, woke up, and all of a sudden, he showed you something? Those spontaneous thoughts are not intellectual. They don't come from your mind. It comes from the Spirit of God, like a river flowing, a spontaneous flow flowing from your spirit. And you know what I found that helps me? That's why I was at Miss Sue workshop the other yesterday, and she had a little pamphlet with questions and blank for you to answer. That is why, you see, God's way of leading us, teaches us, it is sometime when we ask questions. Asking him questions. That is why Jesus said, and I'm going to read you some verse, verses. 1 John 3, 24, he says, By this we know that he abides in us by the Spirit whom he had given us. John 14, 26, he said, The Holy Spirit, the, the helper whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance. 1 John 2, 27, But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you. Hold your thoughts. I'm going to get there. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. What it is saying is that you and I, we've been sent the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth, to guide us, to lead us, to teach us, to show us, to warn us, to help us. So I know what you're thinking. How about my written Bible? How about me, you know, he, let me say something. This is why this Bible college is so powerful. Because they are not teaching you on an intellectual level. Number one, they're teaching you to walk with the Spirit of God. They're teaching you to walk in abiding in Christ and entering into the rest, not by your own works. And they're teaching you the Word on a spirit level, not a theological, hermeneutical. Do you understand what I mean? So now here is, and I'm going to, you know I'm going to do like Nicole. This is my first closing, so that will be my second closing. <laughs> I laughed because Nicole said, okay, I'm going to end with this scripture. And then she had another scripture. And then she had another scripture. So I tell Carrie, I said, that's just our second or third closing. If she can. <laughs> I do the same, so I'm not pointing the finger. I do that all the time. Because the Holy Spirit starts speaking to you. But you see, so how do you approach the Bible? How do you listen to message with the help of the Holy Spirit? He is inside of you. So you know when I hear a, a message, I don't take notes of every little thing. I listen to the Spirit of God in me. And all of a sudden, there's like a quickening. I feel like, oh, something catch my attention, catch my, my heart. So I go, I write the verse, the thought. I'm like, okay. And then later on, I do like the Berean, you know, in Acts 19, verse 11, I go and examine the scripture to see if it is so. And I start digging and asking the Holy Spirit, what did you mean? And what did you say? And why did you say that? And why did you put that word? And now there's like teacher-student relationship where he is teaching me. And I do the same thing. Not only when I read my Bible, we read our Bible not to fill our head full of information and prove to everybody how much we know the Bible. We read our Bible to get to know God, to talk to God, to listen to him. And allowing the Holy Spirit to use that word that we've, you know, put in, we've renewed our mind, our way of thinking with the word, allowing the Holy Spirit to shape us, transform us, talk to us. The word and the spirit. But when I study the word, I do the same way. I let myself be led by the Spirit. What would you want me to, to study? What would you want me to read? And then when I read, all of a sudden, there is a word maybe poof, that jump out of the page. What is that? It's the Holy Spirit said, tss, tss. There's, there's some gold in there I want you to dig. 
You see, it's not me trying to study. It's not me trying to know it and get knowledge. And it's me working with Holy Spirit because he knows what you need to know right now. He knows where you need to go tomorrow. He knows exactly, just like Adam and Eve, he'll give you your portion for the day. He knows where you need to go, how fast you need to go, where you need to go. And he's going to lead you there by you walking with him. And let me do my second closing. <laughs> That's how I listen to message. That's how I study my Bible. That's how I read books or listen to me. I don't go and try like baby, put everything in my mouth. If I pick a book and all of a sudden I don't seem to be able to get into it, it's like I close it. I'm like, it's either you don't want me to read it or it's for another time. I'm not ready. But when I pick a book or listen to a message and all of a sudden my spirit comes alive, I feel a connection in my heart. It's the Holy Spirit said that is there for you right now. Come on, go and get it. And you know I get it and it's like, I can read it fast enough. Do you see the difference of studying intellectually and going and trying to do it or abiding in God? And here is a, a, a major, is to walk being conscious, aware and conscious 24-7 that Christ lives in you that he lives in you and you in him. And you see, I was talking to somebody the other day. It is not just, and that's great, having that quiet time with good, it's great. It, 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 I love that. But we can go further where we walk through the day conscious that God is in us and we are in him. And we walk through the day sometime, we're stopping and said, oh, wow, God, look at that sunset. Oh, thank you, God. Oh, all through the day, having that consciousness, intentional consciousness of God in us. And when you live that way, you open yourself to hear God. Because you open your heart. You're like, oh, yes, God, I'm so conscious that you're. And you walk, and all of a sudden, your day is full of divine interruption, divine appointment, and divine encounter. And you're like, how did that happen? I'm just abiding in God and God abiding in me. So I end up being at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. I am so sorry. I just went. I'm not going to apologize. Is that okay? <laughs> Miss Carrie, she's so full of grace. But anyway, I know we're going to have ministry time this afternoon, correct? panel and ministry time. So I've got something in my heart for this afternoon to minister to you ladies, but I'm going to right now respect the time and we're going to call it a wonderful day. And let me tell you now, you know the grand finale always for the end? You leave the best, the dessert, the best for the end. So buckle up, put your seat belt, get your heart ready because Miss Carrie, she's loaded, she's going to... You talking fireworks, she's going to get it looking beautiful. So come making a demand on her gift and her anointing. Amen. Amen. We're going to take a quick super break. And as Andrew says, do what you do quickly. Be back in the auditorium at 11. <laughs>